Um, so I'm Charlie Anderson. I'm a faculty member in the CEMB, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's future leaders and mechanobiology speaker, Nadia Ayad. Um, so Nadia is a PhD candidate in the UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco graduate program in bioengineering and works in the Valerie, Valerie Weaver lab at UCSF. Uh, Nadia's thesis uh, focuses on how mechanical cues uh, regulate germ layer specification during early anthesis, focusing on mesoderm boundary setting using an in vitro gastrulation model. And the title of Nadia's talk today is Force Dependent Beta Catenin Regulation Initiates Mesoderm Signaling and Cell Death Mediates Mesoderm Boundary in a 2D Gastroloid Model. So, one fun connection I have with Nadia is that I worked on beta catenin in my undergraduate lab uh, working on Drosophila melanogaster. And it's, it'll be really fun for me to hear uh, some updates on beta catenin. Um, so Nadia, the screen is yours and take it away. Thank you so much, Charlie, for the introduction. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm really excited to share uh, the bulk of my thesis. Uh, and we're hoping to publish some of these stories uh, in the near future. Um, but uh, the, the goal of this project is to understand a little bit more about um, how gastrulation occurs um, in, in vitro. So we can model gastrulation. And for those of you that don't know, gastrulation is the first event during embryogenesis where you have uh, the specification of uh, embryonic patterning and also uh, morphogenesis happening uh, during the embryo. So uh, during human gastrulation, you have, uh, can you see my, my mouse here? Yeah, great. So you have, uh, and this, um, uh, during the embryo, you have the epiblast uh, formed in this bilaminar disc with the support of the hypoblast and the trophoblast surrounding it. Uh, but during the course of gastrulation that happens uh, um, about 14 days after implantation, after um, Yes, uh, you have the occurrence of gastrulation where cells starts to ingress and forming the mesenderm and the primitive streak. And then they finally form the three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm here. So we can model this using uh, micropatterning. Um, and uh, once you add this morphogen BMP4 to the cell culture medium, what we can see is that the three markers that would um, later form uh, the three germ layers, so ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, they form in this very uh, uh, characteristic pattern. And we use this as a model of the signaling pathways that are involved in the process of gastrulation. Uh, and we're particularly interested in mesoderm in our case, and our questions are surrounding forces, since we are interested in, in the interplay of me mechanics, because Embryogenesis is a very complex uh, process where you have the push and pull of several of these cells intercalating and forming these complex structures and 3D structures in the embryo. So how are those forces that the cells are creating during this process of gastrulation, specifying the fate decision and creating the boundaries between these three germ layers? So for that, um, we already know that the early embryo has a soft microenvironment. Here we took uh, John Muncy, a uh, previous grad student in our lab uh, took a chick embryo during stage three when, when um, gastrulation is occurring and did AFM to measure the elasticity of this embryo. And what we could see is that uh, the embryo is much softer than the, the normal ways of um, studying gastrulation in vitro that use uh, tissue culture plastic or um, hard PDMS uh, substrates. So uh, with this information, we decided to use um, uh, soft gels uh, with uh, an elasticity of up to three kilopascals in our model system and uh, used human embryonic stem cells on these hydrogels uh, using BMP4 as our morphogen. And what you can see is that when they are unconfined, uh, and this is just a nuclear marker, you can see the formation over the course of differentiation, and this is 48 hours uh, for us you have this formation of nodes um, that are very um, marked in the edges of these colonies. And in particularly, we can see the emergence of several of the morphogenetic uh, movements that you would expect during gastrulation uh, that is ingression. So you see the cells moving 
downwards in this uh, uh, movie and also intercalating downwards here in this other um, uh, field of view. So we took this as our model to study gastrulation and mechanical forces. And the nice thing about these gels is that we can um, actually see the forces that the, the cells are imparting on the substrate. So if we use traction force microscopy by implementing beads on these gels, we can then uh, measure the forces that, that are present during the course of differentiation. So what you can see here is that uh, in order to um, observe the signaling pathways that are involved, we confine these cells in micro patterns on top of these soft gels uh, and perform traction force microscopy. And what's interesting here is that particularly at the edges of these colonies, um, you see uh, highest traction stresses and here in yellow would be the highest traction stresses that you were observing. And here just a bright field image of, of these colonies. So this is before we even add the, the morphogen, we see the appearance of these forces that are, are pretty characteristic and we can change the, the shapes of these, of the confinement with squares or triangles. And you can see that the forces are localized particularly at the edges and corners. And what is the effect of this confinement? Well, when we add the morphogen and we have a reporter for a mesoderm marker called, called Brachiori or also T or um, or TBXT, what we see is that the areas that had, that had the highest confinement and the, the highest um, contractility are the ones that turn on this mesoderm reporter first. So it's particularly inducing these regions of high cell-cell contractility. So uh, we were wondering whether we can modulate that by changing the geometry and changing the forces that are present in this system. Um, and this is just an average uh, uh, of several of these colonies where you can see where the highest contractility is and where the average T amnion green expression will come up after a differentiation. Um, so we can modulate uh, the geometry of this confinement to, and change the contractility that is involved. So if we use something that we call the Pac-Man, where you have like this concave region now, you have lower traction stresses and this uh, mouth of the Pac-Man. And by decreasing this tension with a different geometry, we can see that the average T expression and particularly the lowest point of uh, contractility is now lower in that area. And we can do the converse by using uh, a PDMS device uh, in collaboration with the Jumping Fu Labs in the University of Michigan. Uh, when we, when they plated these cells on this stretch device, uh, here uh, it's a device where you can add air and stretch the PDMS uh, layer here, and you are then in, imparting an ectopic. Um, tension in these cells. So when we do that, uh, compared to a control, we can see that the ectopic expression of T uh, is, is happening on this system, showing that there is a pretty uh, tight correlation between forces and differentiation um, in our system. So uh, in searching the literature, we find, found uh, this work from Emmanuel Farge's lab that showed that um, beta catenin which is uh, which binds to E coherin in the cell cell junctions uh, has a tyrosine residue that upon the appearance of, uh, upon stretching local stretching this residue is exposed and is able to be phosphorylated. So uh, the canonical way of of how beta catenin is involved in the the differentiation of these cells is that once you add the morphogen you start this program where beta catenin is phosphorylated by SARCs, removed from the junctions, goes into the nucleus, um, produces winds and maintains the course of differentiation. So we were wondering whether forces could play a role in the system by affecting particularly this residue of beta catenin, the tyrosine 654. So uh, we used an antibody that was specific for the phosphorylation of this residue here in green. And uh, in, in magenta here, you can see an antibody uh, for beta catenin that's not specific for this residue. And what you can observe here is that in the Pac-Man, in the high tension area, this antibody particularly binds really well. However, in the low tension area, it doesn't. And here on the right, you can see an average of several of these colonies for both of these areas. 
showing that tension is, is exposing this uh, beta catenin and tyrosine cis 54 residue in very specific regions. And that might be initiating the program of wind beta catenin in this system. So uh, what we did is uh, we did the acid test was, um, can we mutate this and see whether we can see a change in uh, mesoderm? So I created this uh, dephosphatomimetic uh, mutant where the tyrosine is mutated to a phenylalanine that can be phosphorylated. And here is the construct uh, showing that it's being expressed during the first course of differentiation, just a nuclear marker to see that the construct is being expressed. And what you can observe is that during the course of differentiation, the, the brachyuria expression, so the T induction and mesoderm induction is completely ablated. So you can barely see any expression. And here is a representative image at, at 48 hours showing that there is very little, if, if none of, you can see a couple of cells, but that do not have this uh, construct turned on, um, showing that it, indeed this uh, tyrosine is necessary for the differentiation of these cells and is induced by force too. So we then have this model where uh, in the initial stage, uh, when these cells are confined, you have high traction stretches, particularly in the edge regions of these colonies, and that um, opens up beta catenin to be able to be phosphorylated, removed from the junctions, and go into the nucleus. Whereas in the center, where you don't have the appearance of destruction stresses, beta catenin is not able to be removed from the junctions, it remains junctional. So you initiate this mesoderm program at the junctions, uh, but as these cells undergo EMT, they're able to be more motile, the signal gets uh, transduced inwards, and you can see it on my movies that the 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 mesoderm marker kind of moves inwards, but it eventually stops. So uh, the question that I was interested in, in addressing was, how is that boundary maintained? How um, how far in will that signal go, and what it, what stops it? Um, so in as an inspiration for understanding this, uh, I. This work from the Takashi Mikawa's lab at UCSF showed that in the chick embryo, when you have the formation of the primitive streak, you have this deposition of apoptotic cells, particularly in the midline. And usually when these cells are undergoing um, gastrulation, they, they undergo EMT and they're very motile. But the cells that are undergoing EMT on the left side of the embryo only stay within the left side and the ones that are on the right side stay on the right side. So that's ipsilateral migration. Um, however, when you remove these uh, apoptotic cells from the embryo and prevent cell death from occurring, you actually allow these cells from to go from the left side to the right side and the right side from and to the left side, showing that the cell death could act as a boundary that and they showed that it was dependent on ECM and the patterns of migration of these cells. So my question was, could cell death act as a boundary for patterning? and signaling in our system as well. So um, just as a primer for uh, program cell death, it's a pretty well-regulated process. Um, when a cell dies, it has several uh, programs that are involved in both preventing apoptosis, uh, promoting apoptosis, so pro-apoptotic uh, genes, and also they work together with uh, several programs with inside the cell, both internal and external to activate caspase, and then to release uh, cytokines and other uh, molecules into the extracellular um, uh, media and uh, in order to be, be found and eaten. So once that happens, uh, cells uh, translocate phospholipidoserine, uh, which is a lipid uh, membrane component, and they're able to then be found by phagocytic cells through several uh, receptors and bridging molecules. Uh, healthy cells usually have several receptors that uh, prevent it from being eaten by macrophages and, and, and several uh, uh, non-phagocytic, uh, non-specific uh, uh, phagocytic cells. And once they get uh, tagged and uh, by these uh, phagocytic cells, they're able to be engulfed through several cytosols and rearrangements, 
partic that are particularly dependent on RAC. And then they're digested in the phagolysosome. So I was interested in seeing like each of the those steps and how are they involved in, in, in my system as well. So uh, when I stain my cells before differentiation in the same stage where you would see the, the high traction stresses, what I saw is that was when I averaged several of these images was that there was a, an accumulation of cleave caspase in a particular location that was uh, distant and right proximal to where you would see the highest tracks. So, so it was inwards to the, the colony. And when I differentiated the cells and used a caspase 3 reporter with it, what you'd see here is that um, cells die throughout the whole colony, but they particularly accumulate in this ring inwards and proximal to the T expression. And, and here you can see at 48 hours that uh, in, in an average of several of these movies that um, this ring is particularly um, uh, mutual exclusive to where you would see later T expression, showing that you could play a role in, in, in the boundary as it was right next to the boundary of T. Um, and when I stain these cells and, and wash them with an XN5, uh, what I could see is that these apoptotic cells are highly motile, and they seem to be actively transported and segregated into distinct areas. You could see that each of these white, white dots are an, uh, an XN5 positive uh, dying cell, but they are, are actively being segregated into this inner ring of, of this colony. So I'm going to show you a little bit more in detail this one part. And you can see that there are several of these arms that are being actively transporting this, these cells into particular segregated areas. So since the, there seems to be active transport, uh, I wanted to see whether there are several cytoskeletal regulators might be playing a role in this. And I started with uh, using a rock inhibitor. And what I could see is that when I used the rock inhibitor during the, this process, the pattern of cell death was disrupted, uh, decreased and disrupted towards the, the edge, but also the, the patterning and the mesoderm differentiation was severely disrupted. This would make sense since we've shown that tension was required to, to initiate several of the programs, uh, but, uh, what was surprising to us was also to see how this pattern of cell death was particularly affected. And here you can see it uh, in this um, graph showing how um, this is from zero to the edge of the colony, how where before you had this boundary between the cleave caspase and the T signal, now you have uh, with the rock inhibitor, this complete disruption of the the different uh, boundary that they were creating. So uh, we wanted to see if there was a particular role in, in just the appearance and the, the existence of the cell death and, and how this boundary is created. So what we did was to use a pan caspase inhibitor, uh, in this case, ZVAD, FMK, and see whether the prevention of cell death would affect cell boundary. But before we saw uh, the the, the mesoderm marker, what was interesting to me was that uh, even before starting differentiation, where we looked at the traction stresses, uh, the traction stresses with this uh, um, apoptotic cell death inhibitor was particularly increased in, in almost threefold as high as the, the traction stress forces that you would expect with just the control. Um, so this kind of led us to think that perhaps cell death could act as a tension release mechanism. So when you don't have that, you have this increased tension in the colony. And what is the, the effect of this in our differentiation? Well, with the with preventing cell death, uh, what was remarkable to us is that that boundary now was completely disrupted and it became uh, much more diffuse in our system. So you could see that this signal now goes inwards and cells are able to be more migratory. Uh, but we couldn't really dissect whether there, there was just outright more migration or there was like uh, 
more of an initiation of cells towards this phase since there is an increased tension here. So we wanted to see now what would the mechanism be and what uh, molecules that are involved in cell death um, here in the system could be playing a role in creating this boundary. So we uh, looked at this uh, data set that was publicly available from an actual human embryo during the course of, of gastrulation. And we looked at several of genes that are involved in both apoptosis, phagocytosis, and engulfment. And what was remarkable to us was that in particularly, several genes that are involved in the phagocytic machinery were particularly um, more expressed in layers that are not involved in mesoderm. So you can see that uh, mesoderm premature streak, which is uh, what we were more interested in, downregulated a lot of these genes that are involved in, um, in phagocytosis and apoptosis itself. So uh, we wanted to look at in our, our cells themselves, whether that was true. So we sorted uh, both T positive and T negative cells and uh, did a panel of several of these genes. We started with just genes that are involved in apoptosis and it was uh, interesting to see that there was no difference in, impression, in expression between the T negative and T positive cells in both anti-apoptotic, pro-apoptotic and uh, find me genes as well. But uh, what was interesting to us was when we looked at the bridging molecules and some of the EME signals that we would expect uh, during phagocytosis, uh, the, some of these bridging molecules like GAS6 are highly upregulated in T-negative cells. So in T-negative cells that you would expect in the center. So we did a, an experiment just to check whether um, whether that could be true. And um, the experiment that we thought was that um, if you add a high enough dose of an exon, an exon binds to phosphatidylserine, which is the molecule that would be bound to phagocytic cells. So uh, with, enough, with a high enough dose of an exon, uh, it would block the recognition of the phosphatidylserine site and prevent it, the, the recognition of dead cells in our system. So uh, it was really impressive to us that this experiment promote highly, a highly disorganized uh, expression of mesoderm in our system. So uh, now we had cells that were turning on this mesoderm marker throughout the whole colony, which was uh, really surprising to us showing that um, the recognition of, of dead cells itself uh, is, is important for regulating the, the signal in, in, in our system. And here again, it's an average of several of these showing that now the signal gets, uh, gets transmitted throughout the whole colony. So now we have this uh, model where uh, in the initial stage, we have high attraction stresses, uh, and that promotes an initial program of, of mesoderm through beta-catenin, but you also have uh, epiplotic cells, and their recognition is might be regulating the boundary of this signal later on during the course of differentiation. So we're really interested in seeing um, how the interplay of tension uh, is playing a role in this recognition. Um, some of our hypotheses include uh, those appearances. If you notice those arms that are, that are pulling those cells. Um, so the regulation of those uh, arms, which are actin positive, uh, might be playing a role in, the, in mechanically regulating the, the, the recognition of these dead cells and might be playing a role in the, in the in the regulation of the signal itself. So uh, with that, I wanted to sort of uh, keep it brief in this overview, but also thank uh, most of my lab that, that helped in this project and in particular John Muncy, where you see the, the first half of the story uh, that we were able to publish uh, some of it. Um, and John Lakins that did uh, a lot of the work in, in the genetics in this system as well. With that, 
and and also my funding sources and thank you so much a clap for the audience <laughs> thanks so much nadia um that was a great and very concise uh so we have plenty of time for questions. If anybody in the audience wants to ask a question, just feel free to virtually raise your hand via the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom panel, and I can call on you. Um, and I would ask that if you do want to ask a question, just please uh, turn on your video and unmute so Nadia can see you. Um, Nadia, it's totally up to you, but if you want to stop sharing, that way we can see the whole uh, gallery of, of, of people. Uh, some people might have a specific question about a specific slide, so, so keep those slides up just in case we want to go back and look at something. Um, maybe I'll start off with a question. Uh, so this is a, a based on 20 year old knowledge of beta catenin signaling, so it's it's probably a little naive on my part. But when I think about beta catenin, one of the things I, I think of it doing is, is helping to maintain and strengthen adherence junctions and therefore allow cells to pull on each other. And in your model, tension that's inducing the, the phosphorylation at the tyrosine residue, and then that's causing beta catenin to potentially leave the adherence junctions uh, and travel into the nucleus. So I guess my question is, if that happens, do, do the cells somehow lose the ability to pull on each other, or do they gain that ability, gain that ability or, or modulate that ability to pull on each other and, and maintain that tissue tension? Yeah, so... Um they start off this program by removing beta catenin from the junctions into the nucleus and start an EMT program where uh, these cells uh, downregulate coherin and upregulate in and coherin. So they uh, change the, their coherin junction program. So they, they're still able to pull on each other, but since they are uh, more mesenchymal, uh, they now are upregulating a lot of their uh, cell substrate um, um, programs with integrins uh, during this process as well. Um, so they do lose some of it, and uh, it's it's part of the the gastrulation process itself in the morphogenetic pro pro program where they ingress and now are able to migrate further uh, into the primitive streak. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll, and I, I've I've spent the last ten or studying plant cells, which actually don't move relative to each other. So that's why I'm a little bit rusty on this, you know, cell migration stuff. But uh, you know, maintaining tissue contact, but also being able to migrate, seems like a a sort of tricky balance to establish for these cells. Um, in terms of the apoptotic cells, they presumably aren't maintaining very strong connections with their neighbors because you were showing some nice data showing that they can be sort of pulled and moved around. Um, is that then creating its own kind of mechanical signal, the absence of tissue tension in those regions of dead cells uh, in a way that is, is sort of sensed by the neighboring cells? Is that kind of physical or is that different? Yeah, so um, what's interesting about the apoptotic cell is that they get extruded uh, upwards. So if you can imagine sort of uh, an epithelial layer, uh, those apoptotic cells are sitting sort of on the top. Um, and as they're uh, dying, they sort of, there's some papers that suggest that they, they themselves as they're dying promote uh, forces in order to be like pulled from the ep epithelial layer outwards to the, the apical junctions. Um, and what I'm seeing that it seems that the apical layer itself is still is promoting some level of uh, connection to those apoptotic cells and pulling them towards the particular regions, but still maintaining the 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 epithelial um, um, junctional integrity, um, at least in the in the inner uh, part of this colony. Yeah, great. Um... I'll pause my because I have a lot more questions, but I'll pause and let some other people ask questions if they have them. So anybody can feel free to either raise your hand virtually or just go ahead and turn on your video as a, as a signal that you want to ask a question. That's fine too. I especially encourage students and, and trainees to ask questions if they have them. are feeling shy on Zoom today.
maybe I'll ask one more question uh, and then stop. <laughs> so in terms of 2D versus 3D, right? I was thinking about the sort of topology of your of your colonies. Um, you know, you showed most of your data in 2D, but I'm presuming that there's some thickness and maybe even some cell layers in the colonies. And uh, are you kind of exploring the tension relative, the relative tension that's across those different layers in the Z direction in your colonies? And does, do you think that matters in terms of maintaining the identity of the subtypes of cells in the colony? And, um, you know, is there a difference, for instance, if you make a, a sort of very bulgy, you know, more three-dimensional colony versus a flatter colony? Yeah, uh, there is definitely a difference. Um, and uh, you do see that these cells, they, as you get like denser colonies, they do form, like become bulgy and they tend to uh, round up and form 3D structures that are more um, what you would expect to see in an embryo. So the 2D is very, um, is, is not necessarily uh, physiological, um, but you, you can see that as, as if you let this course of differentiation go for longer, you would see several layers of these cells forming and in particular, but you will, you, what's interesting is that the, the mesoderm differentiation and the T signal, it's always going inwards and, and, and under um, these layers of cells as you would expect in, in the perimeter streak formation. Great. Thank you. Medora has a question. Go ahead, Medora. Hi, Nadia. It was a really great talk. Sorry, my audio is not functioning well. So in case the uh, you can't hear me, I'll just type out my question later. But I was um, you had one image in the beginning where you had um, the the phosphorylated beta catenin that was that you did some immunostaining for in the embryo. Mm -hmm. um, or like your model, but I was wondering what the total beta catenin looks like in the same, in, in sort of like the same system. Yeah, uh, I can show you. So essentially, the total beta catenin is present um, throughout the whole colony. Uh, so. There you go. <laughs> this one, you mean? So here in yeah. Magenta, you can yeah, see the total I beta catenin. Okay. And it is junctional, particularly before the quartz differentiation, you see it uh, pretty well uh, uh, localized at the junctions uh, mm -hmm. in throughout the whole colony. Um, so not just in, in the areas of high tension or, or low tension. Okay. And, uh, but after um, 24 hours, you would expect to see, particularly in the, in the areas of high tension, uh, this beta catenin already uh, being um, becoming a little bit more diffuse going into the cytoplasm and into the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And um, then uh, more nuclear um, as you go later on through, during the course of differentiation. Okay, so the, the, the tyrosine is, okay. So the tyrosine is only specifically exposed in the areas of high tension then? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 